All right. Well, welcome everyone. Um, as a UC Santa Cruz alumni council member, I'd like to welcome you to our monthly speaker series, Slugs and Steins, Lectures from UC Santa Cruz. I'm April Yi, um, Oaks 2002. And for those who are new, our Slugs and Steins series engages a, a UC Santa Cruz faculty member in discussion with you, the local community of Silicon Valley and our extended community online. Um, with a goal of making us all Renaissance people. And we want it to feel just like you're at UC Santa Cruz sitting in class, but with drinks and without tests. Um, Mike Reapy, another volunteer organizer, is with me tonight, and we're both alumni. I'm a holistic life coach focusing on transformative self-care for professionals, and Mike spends his days as an engineer, Silicon Valley style. He'll be helping me with the Q&A and you'll hear more from him at the end. Um, before we get started, and since we can't see you, we'd like to know where you're, you're zooming in from and how many people are watching. Um, so please take a moment to fill out a short poll that just popped up on your screen and we'll share the results after we've given everyone a moment to respond. Okay, I think the poll is completed. So now you should be able to see the results of our poll and who is in this virtual room with you. So it looks like a lot of folks from Santa Cruz and the Bay Area. Um, <laughs> someone usually responds that they're in outer space. Um, so thank you for responding to that poll. Um, so this evening, we'll be tipping our steins with Jennifer Lynn Kelly, who is an associate professor of feminist studies and critical race and ethnic studies at UC Santa Cruz. Her research broadly engages questions of settler colonialism, U.S. empire, and the fraught politics of both tourism and solidarity. Her first book, Invited to Witness, Solidarity Tourism Across Occupied Palestine, uh, from Duke University Press, spring 2023, is a multi-sided interdisciplinary ethno ethnographic study of solidarity tourism in Palestine. In it, she analyzes the ways in which solidarity tourism has emerged in Palestine as an organizing strategy that is both embedded in and working against histories of sustained displacement. Her next project, co-edited with Samdeep Sen of Rothschild University and Lila Sharif of University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign is Detours, a Decolonial Guide to Palestine, an edited volume in the Detours series at Duke University Press. And so we'll address questions at the end of the talk, but you don't have to wait until the last minute. You can type them in at any time in the Q&A box. And if you see someone else's question that you like, you can upvote it and we'll ask it sooner. Um, this talk is being recorded. So in a few days, you'll be able to find it on the UC Santa Cruz Arts and Lectures YouTube channel. And we'll post the link in our social media channels and follow up emails. So does everyone have their steins? I have my tea. Um, I've got your slug, Associate Professor Jennifer Kelly. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much. Um, so thank you to April, Mike, and Diana for, and also all the slugs and Stein's organizing team and the UCSC Alumni Association for inviting me to share my research with you. As a UCSC um, alum myself, I uh, graduated I did feminist studies and literature at Santa Cruz, um, graduated in 2005, and then came back as faculty in 2018. So as an alum myself, I'm happy to be part of this series, and I'm so looking forward to the conversation. I also have an 11-month-old, so she might be making an appearance later. Um, and I think this is my first talk since uh, she was born, so I'm both very tired and very happy to be here. <laughs> 
So what I'll do today is talk to you all about my book, uh, forthcoming in January, Invited to Witness Solidarity Tourism Across Occupied Palestine. So I'll start sharing my screen as well now. And that's working, I, I imagine. Um, so, all right. So um, I'm gonna talk to you about my book, forthcoming in January, Invited to Witness Solidarity Tourism Across Occupied Palestine. I'm gonna share briefly about my next two projects in the works, and then I'll spend some time with some examples from my field work. So Invited to Witness is a multi-sided interdisciplinary ethnographic a study of solidarity tourism in Palestine that draws from field research I completed in Palestine as a 2012 to 2013 and 2019 to 2020 Palestinian American Research Center fellow and from archival research and interviews I did in the US as a doctoral candidate in American studies at UT Austin as a postdoctoral fellow in communication at UC San Diego and in Asian American studies at UIUC and as faculty in feminist studies and critical race and ethnic studies at UC Santa Cruz. I'll begin today by laying out the framework and scope of the book project, and I'll share with you what the book does as a whole and how each chapter fits in. And then I'll spend most of my time on the book's seventh chapter, which draws from interviews with tourists and tour guides to detail the fraught politics of witnessing in Palestine. I'll end today by reiterating the stakes of my project, both for the political project of tour guiding in Palestine and how we think about the politics of invitation in colonial contexts. So to begin, I'll explain some of my methods, key terms, and central arguments. The solidarity tours I analyze in the book range from day trips to West Bank cities and villages, bus tours through East Jerusalem, walking tours in villages and city centers inside Israel that were once and or are still Palestinian. Drawing from participant observation of solidarity tours, interviews with guides, organizers, and tourists, and then archival research on the report back genre and analyses of virtual tours. I explore what happens when tourism understands itself as solidarity and what happens when solidarity functions through modalities of tourism. I use the term solidarity tourism to refer to forms of travel that are animated by a desire on the part of tour guides to cultivate support for their cause and tourists desire to establish a deeper connection to a particular social movement. And I argue that solidarity tourism in Palestine functions as a localized political strategy and an emergent industry through which Palestinian organizers refashion conventional tourism to the region by extending deliberately truncated invitations to international tourists to come to Palestine and witness the effects of Israeli settler colonial state practice on Palestinian land and lives. Tour guides goals are multiple. By staging tourist encounters with everyday Palestinian life, organizers seek to challenge Israeli state sanctioned narratives and offer tourists Palestinian accounts of Israeli state violence and settler colonialism. Organizers also employ tourism to help Palestinian shop owners and farmers stay on land that is under the threat of expropriation. Organizers invite tourists to witness and also invite them to go home and do their work from there where their complicity is most entrenched and their advocacy most needed. Tour guides invitations to tourists take the shape of Palestinian guides and organizers inviting tourists to Palestine and then inviting them to go home. Tourists are asked not to come to Palestine and stay as volunteers or volunteerists, as activists or as protective presence for Palestinians under siege as the international solidarity movement has historically asked of international volunteers. Instead, tourists are told at every turn, your work is not here. This daily labor on the part of tour guides is a project of restructuring international desire to help Palestinians into reminders to tourists that their job is to go home and do their work from there, both in solidarity with Palestinians and from a place of complicity in their subjugation. Finally, organizers work to confront the racialized asymmetries that arise in an industry that necessarily privileges tourist accounts of what they witness over Palestinian narratives of their own displacement, where tourists travel to Palestine to see for themselves what Palestinians have long detailed in the historical record. Taking as my subject a phenomenon that is too often relegated to one side or another of a good tourism, bad tourism binary, I instead analyze the complex ways in which solidarity tourism has emerged in Palestine as an organizing strategy and industry 
that is embedded in and working against histories of sustained displacement. I show how in their daily labor, Palestinian tour organizers under the constraints of settler colonial military occupation and in a context where they do not control their borders rest both the capacity to invite and in Edward Said's words, the permission to narrate from Israeli control. I also detail the ambivalences and asymmetries that take shape in solidarity tourism's orbit, charting the conditions that have led Palestinians to make their case to the international community through solidarity tourism in the first place. In this way, my book is a history of the colonial present that asks why Palestinian organizers have turned to tourism as an organizing strategy and income generating business, despite its fraught asymmetries and how tour guides and tourists, albeit radically unevenly, attempt to craft an anti-colonial movement outside of a strictly witness slash witnessed relationship and despite the epistemic violence or violence at the site of knowledge production and settler logics that structure their encounter. I construct a historical chronology in the book that traces the material of contemporary solidarity tours to Zionist land expropriation that began as early as 1908, positioning displacement as in Palestine as ongoing and sustained. The book draws from ethnographic fieldwork in the West Bank, Jerusalem, and inside Israel's 1948 borders alongside secondary research on Gaza, yet resists dividing these spaces from one another by chapter and thus mirroring the fragmentation of Palestine, Palestine itself in book form. Instead, the manuscript begins the story of solidarity tourism in Palestine with delegations during the first Intifada, but also travels across the 20th and 21st century and crosses borders, checkpoints, and green lines to narrate continuities in displacement sustained exile and the shifting strategies in organizing against expulsion that have animated solidarity tourism, first as a strategy and then as an industry in occupied Palestine. In this sense, my project not only reveals the fragmented terrain to which Palestinian guides invite tourists, but also seeks its own alternative structure beyond fracture and fragmentation and beyond a straightforward chronology to tell this history. The first chapter, draws from pamphlets, report backs, speeches, and artist statements from solidarity tours to Palestine during the first Intifada, 87 to 93, to chart how this phenomenon emerged as a political strategy in Palestine. I show how these archival materials are characterized by a studied and curious unwillingness to cite Palestinian literature and tourists' simultaneous need to, quote, see for themselves. I argue that this phenomenon wherein tourist witnessing functions as an alibi for research became institutionalized in solidarity tourism before it became a legalized profession in Palestine and persists in contemporary solidarity tour itineraries. In chapter two, I chart the emergence of solidarity tourism both as a product and a critique of the 1993 US brokered Oslo Accords and the attendant establishment of the Palestinian Authority and its Ministry of Tourism. I focus on the deeply and I argue deliberately asymmetrical nature of solidarity tourism in Palestine. And I show how Palestinian tour guides are guiding tours through spaces that often they themselves cannot go and do this in an attempt to use tourist mobility to highlight their own immobility under military occupation and to keep Palestinians from shop owners to farmers on their land in the face of forced exile. This chapter leads into three case studies um, that move between contemporary solidarity tours in Palestine and the historic displacement that the tours trace. The third chapter follows Palestinian olive planting and harvesting programs that connect contemporary Israeli destruction of olive trees to the long history of Zionist deforestation in Palestine. Tracing the history of Zionist displacement and the state's attempted erasure of Palestinian agricultural presence, tour guides use the ritual of repetition reciting these histories and connecting them to the present alongside the ritual of planting and harvesting itself to showcase erasure in Palestine, frame contemporary settler and state violence and settlement expansion as part of a long and ongoing history of displacement in Palestine and keep Palestinian farmers on their land that is constantly under the threat of annexation. The fourth chapter analyzes solidarity tours of Jerusalem as a multiply occupied, multiply occupied city. Some of these tours cover the eastern part of occupied Jerusalem with settlements extracting land and resources from Palestinian neighborhoods that are not granted municipal services. Others focus on the old city of Jerusalem with settlements taking over the top floors of Palestinian apartment buildings and Israeli archeological and tourist projects excavating the tunnels beneath Palestinian homes. 
Still others take tourists to West Jerusalem neighborhoods with Israelis occupying mansions like this one that belonged to affluent Palestinians before their exile in 1948. Together, they reveal three differently occupied sites across the same city, resulting in the combined isolation, fragmentation, and expulsion of the Palestinians who live there. The fifth chapter takes Palestinian solidarity tour guides inside Israel's 1948 and 1967 borders as its subject and describes what the return of Palestinian refugees could look like in this space. Studying tours that span the Palestinian village Amwas, raised in 1967, now donor-funded Canada Park, the Palestinian village Ein Hod, now Dada artist colony and tourist site Ein Had, and the segregation in so-called mixed cities like Haifa, Jaffa, and Nazareth, this chapter refuses to use solidarity tourism in Palestine as a shorthand for solidarity tourism in the West Bank, and instead looks at how these tours take shape and what they do across historic Palestine. The sixth chapter, Archives attempts to reach Gaza through initiatives that sometimes resemble tourism during the past 14, 15 years of the Israeli siege, culling largely from a digital archive of virtual tours. Through these initiatives, Palestinians in Gaza are combating not only the siege, but also the representations of Palestinians in Gaza as under siege and nothing more. This chapter walks chronologically through some of the myriad forms of virtual tourism that Palestinians in Gaza have crafted before, in between, and after Israeli military incursions into Gaza in 2008 and 9, 2012 and 2014, showing how Palestinians in Gaza have worked to circumvent the splintering of Gaza from the rest of Palestine and from the international world at large. Chapter seven turns to interviews with US tourists about how they interpret the ethics of their fleeting moments in Palestine as tourists and their role as witnesses back home. As Israeli and US state distinction narratives have constructed Palestinians as unreliable narrators, Palestinian organizers are compelled to strategically use solidarity tourists as witnesses in Palestine in order to furnish their accounts of settler colonial violence with evidentiary weight. In this context, solidarity tour alumni's words, and particularly their translation of what they witness in Palestine, often carry a legitimacy that Palestinian narrators are not granted. Thus, while solidarity tourism works to put settler colonialism on display and intervene in histories of displacement, it is also wholly rendered necessary by settler colonial logics that construct Palestinian narrators as suspects and indelibly shape what counts as evidence. I conclude the book by the exploring the paired questions of hope and futurity as they are articulated through solidarity tourism in Palestine. I call these questions not as a rhetorical a device to index themes, but as real questions. Articulations of a futurity that is consistently under threat of erasure and descriptions of hope that is precarious but unyielding. I detail not only how tour guides think about their labor in, the context, in a context in which the future of solidarity tourism would render it obsolete, but also how they see their work as a potential, if uncertain, safeguard for the future of their presence in Palestine. Before I share with you some examples from the seventh chapter, which details how tour guides remix the act of witnessing for US tourists, I'll talk briefly about my next two book projects. The first, Detours, A Decolonial Guide to Palestine, is a volume in the Detour series of alternative guidebooks at Duke University Press that I'm co-editing with Leila Sharif in Asian American Studies at UIUC and Somdeep Sen at Roskilde University. The Detour series upends the genre of guidebook, which ordinarily addresses the tourist as consumer by centering indigenous and place-based knowledge. Each book in the series with Detours, A Decolonial Guide to Hawaii, co-edited by Hokulani Aikau and Bernadette Gonzalez, who are now the series editors, as the first includes essays, stories, artwork, itineraries, and maps that reroute the tourist or reader away from colonial desire and toward decolonized futures. Detours, A Decolonial Guide to Palestine will showcase Palestinian art, cultural production, poetry, narrated walking tours, essays, maps, and satiric postcards that demonstrate how Palestinians reshape forms of tourism to their homeland in order to imagine a Palestine before and after colonization. Upon publication of Invited to Witness and Detours Palestine, I will turn to my second monograph, a study of the history and narrative logics of US Christian Zionism and the labor of Christian anti-racist organizers who resist its tenets. I have already undertaken substantial research on US Christian Zionism and have begun interviews with Christian Palestine solidarity activists who work to reframe their community's relationships to Zionism. Uh, 
drawing from literature across multiple different disciplines that have unpacked the language and affect of evangelism, I aim to understand the transnational conversations, spiritual renegotiations, and international travel that have characterized these conversions of a sort toward Palestine solidarity and away from Christian Zionism. This work will also take seriously the political implications of travel, the contours of US foreign policy, the racialized and gendered underpinnings of Israeli state practice, and the affective labor of narration within cross-border movement building. So now that you know the sort of overall shape of my book project and some of the other questions that animate my long-term research agenda, I can turn to some key examples from my fieldwork. Treating Palestine as a central site of inquiry for American studies, feminist studies, ethnic studies. For the remainder of the talk, I'm gonna show how Palestinian tour guides negotiate on each solidarity tour. Violence at the site of knowledge production that has shaped tourist expectations of Palestine and their understanding of their potential role in Palestinian freedom struggles. While solidarity tourism as a phenomenon is structured by the tourists coming to see for themselves, in spite of the volumes of literature Palestinians have produced on their own condition, and while tourists and not Palestinians are then positioned as expert witnesses in Palestine, tour guides and organizers define the contours of that invitation to witness. Tour guide's invitation is not an invitation for tourists to voyeuristically witness Palestinian abjection. Tour guides practice a studied refusal to perform subjection for tourists, notwithstanding their employment in an industry that treats the performance of subjection as a prerequisite. Following native anthropologist Audra Simpson's theorization of what her interlocutors refuse to say and what she as an ethnographer refuses to write, I show how tour guides refuse to participate in the performance of reliving their trauma for tourists. The story I tell also calls from a feminist ethnographic practice that centered on asking tour guides about the labor of their everyday work, not asking them to again recount their own displacement. I show that while solidarity tourism functions as a site where tourists gather evidence and witness displacement, it is also a space where intimacies are forged, both within and outside the parameters of evidence and witnessing. In crafting these connections, tour guides attempt to reveal for tourists a social life in Palestine that resists what my colleague and co-collaborator Leila Sharif calls the vanishment of Palestine. In what follows, I'll share some excerpts that appear in my final chapter that show how U.S. tourists come to Palestine in search of evidence and how tour guides simultaneously name, meet, and disrupt the violence of that expectation. First, a snapshot. As a Palestinian tour guide led a group of 20 solidarity tourists around the city center of Nablus in the northern West Bank in 2012, a curious U.S. tourist stopped to marvel at a blackened section of a nearby wall. What happened here? She asked the tour guide, pointing to the unidentifiable black matter next to where a shop owner's door was coming off its hinges. The other tourists looked to where she looked, like her, eagerly in search of evidence. Oh, that, the tour guide shrugged. Someone was just spray painting their bed frame against the wall. The tourist, visibly disenchanted, resumed the walking tour, mumbling, oh, I thought it was from like a bomb or something. In another moment, walking through Ida refugee camp in 2019, a returning tourist to Palestine asked the guide what happened to the UN school next to the separation wall in Bethlehem. The school had been riddled with bullet holes. It had recently been shuttered and moved to a new location. The guide explained that he was glad it was moving, further away from the wall, less a monument to Israeli assaults. The tour guide, the tourist rather, expressed palpable disappointment, explaining, but it would have been so good to show other tourists. Why, the guide asked. For evidence, she answered. Look around you, he gestured to the narrow streets of the camp, the wall, the murals. There is evidence everywhere. On solidarity tours, tourists come to Palestine in search of evidence of Israeli occupation. And in moments like these, Palestinian tour guides both meet those expectations for evidence and simultaneously resist performing subjection for the tourist gaze. Further, they do so within a profession that in fact relies on their willingness to provide evidence to tourists who have come to see for themselves. Many solidarity tourists describe what they saw in Palestine as so egregious, they could not believe it until they saw it. Some tourists will anchor their witnessing in the books they have read, asserting that no amount of research could have prepared them for what they saw on the ground. Other tourists will name the incapacity of the US media to accurately represent Palestine to prepare them for what they saw. Still other tourists will position their disbelief as something reconciled only by seeing another's suffering. As one tourist but bluntly put it, 
you almost can't believe it until you see the tears in their eyes. This statement epitomizes the asymmetry in power and privilege that inheres in what many call occupation tourism. Grounded in both skepticism and spectatorship, it demands a performance of suffering that is deemed necessary in order to demonstrate veracity. In the shared and repeated recitation of irreconcilable disbelief in Palestine, it is clear that what Palestinians confront is not a question of evidence, but a question of epistemology. In spite of the vol volume of work produced by and about Palestinians, despite the many times Palestinians have narrated and re-narrated their stories of displacement and dispossession, and notwithstanding the extensive historical work and cultural production of the Nakba and its aftermath, tourists still cannot believe it until they see it. The simultaneous incapacity and refusal to believe Palestinian narratives of displacement can not only be reduced to stubborn ignorance on the part of the tourist. Instead, it speaks to the pervasive ways in which the more broadly circulated knowledge produced about Palestine and Israel, which positions Israel as a beacon of democracy in the Middle East, invalidates a Palestinian perspective before it is even uttered. For this reason, the feminist analytics that have spelled out the contours of epistemic violence are crucial for understanding solidarity tourism as a site, if only aspirational, of anti-colonial praxis in Palestine. The violence at the site of knowledge production produced about knowledge production about Palestine, which has predetermined the imagined geographies through which tourists understand Palestine, reveals the deeply imbricated relationship between colonial rule and the calculus of veracity that structures why Palestinian narrators have had to make their case through tourism in the first place. In this way, why, while an evaluative analysis of solidarity tourism as simply occupation voyeurism would cast tourists as hopelessly ignorant, what their sustained disbelief in fact points to is a much larger historical context in which Palestinians have not been cast as truth-telling subjects or reliable narrators of their own histories. In his 1984 essay, Permission to Narrate, Edward Said wrote, there have been refugees before. There have been states built on the ruins of old. The unique thing about the situation is Palestine's unusual centrality, which privileges a Western master narrative, highlighting Jewish alienation and redemption with all of it taking place as a modern spectacle before the world's eyes. To top it off, Palestinians are expected to participate in this dismantling of their own history at the same time. Said underscores, the spectacle of Israel's colonization of Palestine and how it has unfolded before the world to an applause that privileges Jewish redemption over Palestinian narration. The spectacle of redemption narratives like these is evidenced in everything from the celebration of Israeli afforestation initiatives that have papered over Palestinian villages to the vision of Israel as the only democracy in the Middle East. Said continues to top it all. Palestinians are expected to participate in the dismantling of their own history at the same time. The expectation for Palestinians to dismantle their own histories is reflected in how some solidarity tour organizers in Palestine frame their work. As one independent tour guide, Baha Hilo, explained over cigarettes and coffee in a 2012 interview, solidarity tourism in Palestine functions in a settler colonial context where Israel has commandeered not only the tourism industry, but also the historical narrative. What Israel tries to do through tourism, he said, is sell its own story where the Palestinian is not part of the story. The Palestinian is the problem in the story. The Palestinian is scary in the story. So what has emerged today is you find Palestinian people who are under Israel's control, trying to take over this job by themselves, trying to correct the story that the state of Israel sells about us. In his formulation, solidarity tour organizing is a refusal to ask permission to narrate. It is a refusal on the part of Palestinian tour guides to parrot the narrative advanced through shared settler logics of the US and Israel, a narrative that celebrates Israeli progress while hasten, hastening the erasure of Palestine. For guides like Hilo, solidarity tour organizing becomes a tool to confront tourist incredulity while simultaneously reckoning with the roots of their disbelief. Tourists' incapacity to believe Palestinian voices until they are corroborated by the tourists' own eyes is a theme that appears not only in interviews I conducted over the course of my research, but also in interviews and other forms of report back literature, solidarity tour alumni produce. Black feminist theorist Alice Walker, for instance, explained as she walked through the demolished streets of Gaza in the aftermath of Operation Castled, Israel's bombing campaign on Gaza in 2008 and 9. It's shocking beyond anything I have ever experienced, and it's actually so horrible that it's basically unbelievable, even as I'm standing here and I've been walking here and looking at things here. As another example, anthropologist Anne Laura Stoller described what she saw in Palestine as a scholar of colonialism as a shock of recognition that she could no longer ignore or deny. The collection of adjectives here describe a state of shock upon witnessing in Palestine. 
astonishment and disbelief, recognition and misrecognition, expectations and their disjunctures. This articulation of shock also demonstrates the multiple ways in which working against occupation in Palestine has for many become sutured to witnessing its effects. Tour guides narratives are thus pitched to an audience that is already skeptical at worst or unfamiliar at best. Moreover, this narration is material that will in turn be translated for other skeptical audiences. This narration then on the part of the tour guide and tourist is also about the work of translation, the process of assimilating the raw material of witnessing and making it believable for US audiences. Walker illustrates this point further in the rest of her interview. Um, Jennifer, the audio isn't playing. Oh, it's not. Hmm. Let me um, let me try it. Stop screen share and then. So, um, is that working? It sounds like it. Yeah. Okay. So I'll just rewind. Uh, our producer, Anjali Kamet, in 2009, interviewed you while you were there. I want to play a clip of that. It's shocking beyond anything I have ever experienced. And it's actually so horrible that it's basically unbelievable, even though I'm standing here and I've been walking here and I've been looking at things here, it still feels like, you know, you could never convince anyone that this is actually what is happening and what has happened to these people and what the Israeli government has done. It will be a very difficult thing for anyone to actually believe in. So it's totally important that people come to visit and to see for themselves uh, because the world community that cares about peace and cares about truth and cares about justice will have to find a way uh, to deal with this. We cannot let this go as if it's just okay, especially those of us in the United States who pay for this. You know, I have come here in part to see what I'm buying with my tax money. So Walker's words, like those of other delegates, and solidarity tourists point to a pattern that is endemic to many forms of reporting back. First, a declaration of astonishment, basically unbelievable as I am standing here. Then a discussion of translating this witnessing into forms of storytelling for US audiences. You can never convince anyone that this is happening. Third, an endorsement of solidarity tourism. It's totally important that people come to visit and see for themselves. And fourth, a call to action based on complicity as a member of the US body politic. I have come here in part to see what I'm buying with my tax dollars. This series of ways through which solidarity tourists assimilate the information they are confronted with is repeated so often that it is almost a formula. Disbelief, reconciliation of shock, strategizing on how to share this information, endorsements of witnessing in Palestine, and outrage as a US citizen. To highlight this formula is not to dismiss its political importance, but rather to discern what resonates with solidarity tourists and why. To call attention to and to call to call attention to the stages through which solidarity tourists attempt to understand what they are witnessing, and to convey how they interpret and articulate their work in and after their time in Palestine. To call attention to this formula is also an act of naming that recognizes colonial knowledge production that has rendered Palestinian narratives so illegible that tourists must not only see it to believe it, but also spend much of their time in Palestine calculating how to best translate their witnessing to a recalcitrant audience back home, an audience who, out of convenience or conviction, would prefer to ignore the human rights violations bought and paid for in Palestine, as Alice Walker reminds her audience with their tax dollars. As tourists grapple with how to believe Palestinians in Palestine and how to be believed once they return home, a steady pattern emerges wherein Palestinians are compelled to repeatedly construct themselves as truth-telling subjects for tourists. Further, they labor to do so to an audience that itself needs convincing. In turn, tourists work to translate what they witness in Palestine to yet another doubtful audience that remains skeptical until convinced. I asked each tourist I interviewed to reflect on the work of translating what they had witnessed into the narratives they share when they report back. 
to family and friends in church and university settings or community spaces. More often than not, they pulled out meaningful moments from their time in Palestine that they believed would resonate or hit home with US audiences. One tourist, Maggie Goff, shared stories of her time in Palestine and the people uh, that Maggie met uh, who lived near the wall, which had separated them from their relatives and strangled their businesses. These stories, Goff explained, resonated in a way that the scripted narratives provided on the tour did not. Another US tourist, Addis Screen, shared stories of spending time communicating with children through gestures and fragments of English and Arabic. Green explained that these moments of stilted yet expansive dialogue with kids in Janine allowed for Green to do something in a context where they otherwise felt hopeless. Sarah Alzanoon, a Palestinian American tourist who was the first in her family to visit Palestine since they were expelled in 1948 and was only able to do so as a tourist, shared stories about the Israeli state sanctioned theft of West Bank water, something tangible that people in California, where she was from, could wrap their minds around as people who knew the fallout of drought. Olga Negron, a New Yorker visiting Palestine for the first time, explained that it was the pictures from her trip that most affected those with whom she spoke. Marietta Macy, originally from rural Indiana, shared stories with her community about the farmer she worked with and the land she saw destroyed, confident in the knowledge that a shared understanding of agriculture would help them better understand displacement in Palestine. In each of these moments, tourists narrated the reasons for the choices they made in curating the content of their report backs. They described how they carefully worked to craft a narrative they, which they believed would help in overcoming the ignorance, skepticism, indifference, and or hostility of US audiences. Marianna Macy in particular narrated the varied approaches she takes with audiences of disparate spatial and economic demographics. As a Palestinian, I mean, as a Presbyterian rather, a youth minister living in Louisville, Kentucky, but from rural Indiana, she explained how the story she shared differed dramatically depending on who the audience was. She described how she grew up on a farm in Indiana and began doing Palestine solidarity work while still living there. Her audience in Indiana, in her assessment, had an experiential understanding of what it means to be a farmer, with their land routinely threatened by corporations and crop mandates. They knew what it meant to have their land and livelihood in danger. For her Indiana audience, Macy drew from her experience on the Olive Tree Campaign, a solidarity tourist initiative that brings an international tourist to the West Bank to plant olive trees and harvest olives on Palestinian land that is threatened by settlement expansion. She described planting olive trees in Java and watching Palestinian kids play on the tractors as their parents drove through and around the fields. City folk on the tour, she laughed, were super worried about the kids, but I knew they were fine because that's what my childhood looked like. She described telling vignettes like this alongside stories of displacement and land theft in her report backs to rural Indiana farmers. She also emphasized the role her own positionality played in report backs to rural Indiana farmers and the, the role her own position, positionality played in her legitimacy to speak to them and the political purchase it carried in making sure her audience believed her. I had a personal attachment to them, she explained. Me, a white girl they know and trust is talking to them about people they've been told are terrorists and deserve everything that's happening to them. In this statement, relatively tangential to the larger narrative of her time in Palestine, Macy raises questions about white privilege, rural America, the politics of youth, the proliferating narratives that construct Palestinians as terrorists and the layered, uh, layered issues of translation and legibility. As a white rural young woman from an Indiana farming family, she reads as trustworthy to her audience. Specifically, as a white rural young woman from Indiana farming family, she reads as able to tell them about a people who they otherwise have already have contempt for at worst or indifference toward at best in terms that are deeply racially coded. Macy's retelling highlights how she is imbued with expertise against an Islamophobic and racialized rendering of who counts as trustworthy. In this alchemy, which turns her from tourist to expert because of the knowledge granted by her whiteness, Macy's reception by her audience is a textbook example of what Arab American feminist scholarship has long theorized as the coalescence of sexism, Orientalism, Islamophobia, and Zionism in widely circulated knowledge production about Palestine. It is her position as a white woman that renders her a verifiable source and reliable narrator for her audience, and specifically her position as a white woman against an undifferentiated Palestinian mass, which for her audience means Arab and thus Muslim and thus suspect and thus tethered to antiquated anti-feminist social norms. The labor of solidarity tourism as a profession, business, and organizing strategy is thus predicated, as Baha'i described, on Palestinians correcting the state story, the state of Israel selves.
It is labor defined by debunking the racist, dehumanizing stereotypes tourists bring with them to Palestine and replacing them, tour guides hope, with a vision of a multifaceted people subject to generations of displacement who are living their lives in spite of repeated attempts to subject them to premature death. It is a labor defined too by equipping tourists with the tools to correct the story for audiences and their home countries. That for some, believing Palestinians necessitates traveling to Palestine or listening to those who've traveled to but are not from Palestine is what makes solidarity tourism a project wholly limited by its own starting point. It is a project rendered necessary by colonial logics that force Palestinians to provide evidence of histories of displacement that have long been in the historical, historical record but have been disappeared by knowledge production produced about Palestinians that positions them as incapable of truthfully telling their own histories. For this reason, solidarity tours, on solidarity tours, tour guides work against tours crafted entirely around witnessing suffering and the consumption of evidence. In doing so, they refuse to reinforce the narrative circulated by the Israeli state that Palestinians have never lived in all senses of the word in Palestine. They instead labor to construct tours that do not position Palestinians as defined only by their subjugation. Some tour guides in my interviews with them, for example, sought to rewrite the narrative of solidarity tourists witnessing Palestinian suffering to better reflect the process of Palestinians in their generosity and hospitality, inviting tourists to participate in their resistance. Bistan Kassis, advisor for or then advocacy officer for the Olive Tree Campaign explained, you understand that farmers are resisting every day. Just by going to their field, they're resisting. You going with them during the hottest season for them, which is the season with the most percentage of attacks, you understand that you are partaking in their culture of resistance. Or in another guide's words, these farmers could harvest the trees themselves, but they actually, in their hospitality, allow you to take part in this cultural yearly event. Here, tour guides position generosity, not as a gift tourists are giving Palestinians, but as a gift Palestinians are giving tourists, a generosity in sharing their cultural resistance for a brief moment with internationals in Palestine. In a 2012 interview on the Freedom Bus, a tour that travels through the West Bank with performers who reenact Palestinian narratives in each city and village, one tourist mused, I never thought there would be hanging out in Palestine. Yazin al Zubaydi, then a guide worker, a guide and field worker on the Olive Tree campaign, described these moments of hanging out, sometimes defined by sharing recipes, talking about favorite movies or bands, having tea, smoking, telling jokes, as necessary for the functioning of the tour, a needed reprieve from the constant recitation of putting colonial displacement on display. The inclusion of these moments in the tour cannot be understood solely as colonial examples of native hospitality performed for scores of tourist consumers. Instead, in a context where Israel polices every entry to and exit from Palestine, these moments evidence a Palestine that refuses to be defined solely by the restrictions on living that Israel attempts to impose. Like hanging out, other tourists positioned the hospitality and friendliness they experienced in Palestine as beyond the scope of what they had imagined. Olga Negron, for example, expressed her initial surprise at the kindness, generosity, and hospitality she experienced as a tourist in Palestine. She reflected, we witnessed the extreme kindness, generosity, and friendliness of the Palestinian people. It was actually quite startling to me that even though living years and years under occupation, people wouldn't be hardened or bitter toward outsiders, especially Americans. With the sentiment, Negron touches on another frequently repeated expectation on the part of solidarity tourists, that Palestinians would hate Americans, even if understandably so. She continued, I realized that Palestinians, although often portrayed as not human, were very much in fact one of the most welcoming people I've ever visited. Here again, Negron positions Palestinian hospitality as a surprise, not in keeping with her understanding from US media sources that paint Palestinians as, or Palestine as a hostile place full of dangerous potential terrorists who especially hate Americans. This also reveals the deeply evaluative relationship tourists often have with Palestine, begging the question, why do Palestinians have to be welcoming in order to be free? This friendliness and hospitality tourists find in Palestine is in keeping with colonial tourist tropes as evidenced by feminist imposed colonial critiques of the effects of tourism on colonized spaces. Works by Jamaica Kincaid, Jackie Alexander, and Derek Walcott, among many others, remind us of the innumerable ways in which the friendliness of the native via tourism is expected to outdo the friendliness of any space in the US or Europe. At the same time, solidarity tourism in Palestine occurs in a context in which tourism to Palestine is policed and surveilled. 
Solidarity tourists know before arriving in Ben Gurion International Airport in Tel Aviv that Israel has placed unyielding restrictions on researchers, scholars, activists, tourists with any connection, however tangential, to Palestine. They know if they announce they are going to Palestine, if they have an Arab last name, if they are Muslim, if they have family or friends in Palestine, they will be subject to a lengthy interrogation and possibly refused entry. In 2012, Palestinian guides and organizers collaborated to call attention to this restriction of visitors, inaugurating the Welcome to Palestine campaign, dubbed in Israeli media as the Flytilla, referencing the flotillas that have attempted to break the siege on Gaza. International activists flew to Ben Gurion and declared that they were going to Palestine instead of the usual performance of passing as a tourist to Israel to get to the West Bank. These activists were not let in the country and often were not allowed to board planes in their own country that were Israel bound. Highlighting the surveillance control, restriction of movement and bars against being visited that Palestinians experienced. Flytilla campaign organizer and guest speaker on many solidarity tours in Palestine, Hazen Garcia, emphasized even prisoners are allowed visits. In this political landscape, the hospitality of the invitation welcome to Palestine is not meant to mimic colonial tropes and signify the friendliness of the native. Rather, this invitation is meant to underscore the isolation Palestinians in the West Bank and especially Gaza experience. In this context, the friendliness of Palestinian tour guides invitation to solidarity tourists could be understood as endemic to a colonial form of tourism that demands generosity and hospitality. Yet the friendliness of the invitation is also reflective of an anti-colonial praxis that challenges the isolation that is the Israeli state has sought to impose and sediment. Leisure or hanging out in Palestine and Palestinian hospitality thus form a response to a state apparatus that seeks to keep Palestinians isolated. In this way, tour guides acts of hanging out refuse the subjection Palestinians are expected to perform at the same time that they function as reversals of tropes that typically animate the tourist encounter. These acts bring into focus a Palestine defined not solely by occupation, yet they do so within a profession that is predicated on meeting tourist desire and for authenticity and evidence of occupation under of the occupation under which Palestinians live. Placing hanging out, fun, cultures of resistance, tourism, and occupation in the same analytic frame not only asks when and if tourists derive pleasure or a sense of adventure from touring the occupied, but also asks to what extent hanging out in Palestine has the potential to push back against the image of a Palestinian people defined solely by their subjection. Hanging out in Palestine also works against the accumulation of evidence in a context in which evidence, in fact, abounds. Focusing not only on the content of tours, but also, in al Zubaydi's words, the reprieve from them, makes space for feminist readings of solidarity tourism in Palestine that are prismatic, that see solidarity tourism as both an industry and an anti-colonial praxis, that do not ask Palestinians to again recount the trauma of dispossession for scores of rotating tourists, and that treat the extant evidence of Israeli settler colonialism as well. To conclude, I return to the invitation. Feminist theorist Sarah Ahmed in a different context has called evidence what you accumulate when you are not given places to go. On solidarity tours in Palestine, guides have accumulated evidence against the machinations of a settler colonial state that has sought to bring about their physical and narrative erasure. They are not given places to go in a literal sense in that their movement is foreclosed and their ge geography circumscribed. At the same time, they're not given places to go in terms of narration. For tourists, their stories are pre-written, the expectation for their narratives predetermined, the uh, narrative evidence they have accumulated too often dismissed. Because Palestinian movement and narratives are circumscribed, they are also not given places other than tourism to go. A fraught strategy contingent on an invitation, they have sought to rework in efforts to confront the epistemic violence that structures their relationship to the tourist. Tour guides know that providing evidence is a partial, flawed, and incomplete endeavor. Tourist work does not begin in Palestine, but is, tour guides hope, catalyzed there. In the slow and incremental chipping away at colonial land theft and colonial knowledge regimes, success is difficult to qualify and quantify, rather. But part of that success is not only evidencing for tourists the displacement put into motion by the establishment of the Israeli state on Palestinian land, but also evidencing that Palestinians are living beyond surviving in Palestine. Under a settler colonial regime that refuses to acknowledge Palestinian lives, except through the joint processes of calling for and enumerating their displacement, 
Palestinian tour guides are reworking the tourist encounter in ways that refuse to rehearse the performance of their own suffering and refuse to accept the foreclosure of their own joy. In this way, Palestinian tour guides are explicit about delineating what their invitation is and is not for. It is a subversion of Israeli state practice that seeks to isolate Palestinians from one another and from the international community writ large. It is a reminder to tourists that the evidence that they are accumulating in fact abounds and has long been in the historical record. It is a truncated invitation, an invitation specifically to be a tourist, to come, see, and go home. And as I've shown today, it's an invitation to witness, but it is not an invitation to witness Palestinian performances of subjection. Through their daily labor, tour guides thus repeatedly shape the very conventions, shape and reshape the very conventions that characterize solidarity tourism by first inviting tourists to see for themselves and then intervening in the violence of that desire. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Professor Kelly. Uh, my name is Mike Reapy, uh, along with April. I'm one of the, the volunteer organizers for this series. And I'll uh, first, I'd like to give you a question from uh, Elian Sawafta. Um, uh, oh, in one second. Uh, uh, so she starts out, uh, I think, oh, it's she or he, I'm not sure. I'm sorry. Such an amazing book. Uh, many thanks, Dr. Jennifer. I am wondering, what do you think about the entrance to Palestine? in the shadow of the Israeli control of the borders. They could prevent any tourists or they could push them to go through their areas. And this is a double-edged sword because the Israeli forces could invest, uh, invest this to do more normalization. Um, she note, uh, uh, note, I am a Palestinian student doing my master's degree in PCS in uh, North Carolina. Thank you in advance. Thanks so much. So let me just read your question again. I'm wondering, what do you think Oh, I lost it. Hold on. Oh, I'm sorry. I just. That's okay. Oh, you. Just, oh. Um, to the so. Answer. Uh, okay. So, um, I'm thinking. I'm. I'm responding to the sort of question about the policing of the borders of in terms of entry and exit. So, <laughs> and you're asking um, a question about like just closing the the borders altogether, which of course, as we saw in multiple, multiple um, different contexts with tourism, the um, closing down of tourism industries altogether during COVID. So I think that one thing um, that is an important uh, thing to remember is that, and I would talk to, I would ask tour guides and tour organizers about this, is the question of, of how substantive solidarity tourism is um, in relationship to tourism to Israel-Palestine writ large. And even though it's small, but significant, and even though it's sort of policed and surveilled, it's also, a fa it's also true that tourism is such a huge part of income generation that it's policed, it's sort of allowed to, to persist, right? So it's a lot of the tour guides consider themselves to be working within the constraints of a, of a very colonized sector. So some tour guides I spoke to, and this is a really important distinction um, because a lot of times people will sort of ask, like, what do Palestinians think about solidarity tourism? And there is no answer to that question because Palestinians are varied and have varied opinions, right? On, on multiple forms of, of tourism. And some of the tour guides I spoke to believed that this was um, a real question of, of doing decolonial work in Palestine. Some tour guides I spoke to also talked about um, trying to do this work in a colonized sector in terms of trying to bring to, like how do you organize a tour when you can't organize flights, right? When you can't organize, um, uh tour groups to come in right so there's all, all this sort of work that goes into um inviting tourists and inviting tourists against the uh limitations on receiving tourists that are imposed on you all right thank you um, so there's a question from Carla. Can you discuss how you selected the photo on the cover of your book and what it represents to you as the author of the book? 
for sure. That's my mom. <laughs> um, so I, uh, I have, um, the, the, so the book is my, um, colleague and dear friend, the cover, the image on the cover of the book, um, Tanya Habjuka's art, art, it's her photograph and it's of volunteers in, um, like a youth camp, um, preparing for a, uh, a, the a theater event and they're holding up images of Jerusalem, right, from a place where the people, the children going to that um, theater and the volunteers can't access Jerusalem. And in the back are um, a flock of birds flying up, right? And so it's this moment of looking at how people think about, conceive of, imagine futurity and freedom of movement in a context in which their movement is uh, curtailed and their movement is foreclosed. So I was, the book cover just happened um, very recently and, and I'm really happy to be able to share her work. And I also have her work in the seventh chapter. She has a, a photograph series called Occupied Pleasures and it was a book also. And there's um, photos of Palestinian youth in Gaza doing parkour off of demolished buildings, right? There's photographs of um, teenagers in Ramallah getting ready for a dance. So it's all these images that uh, really um, go up against the sort of well-worn tropes of Palestinian suffering and subjection to show occupied, what she calls occupied pleasures. So I think her work does a really beautiful job of of flagging those narratives and refusing them, which is very similar to the work that the tour guides do every day. Okay, um, now I have, a, I have a question from Gilbert Stein uh, and Gilbert has asked kind of a, a series of questions. So I'm gonna try and summarize those into, into one if I can. Um, I, the first question is whether there are specific uh, LGBTQ tours in Palestine uh, uh, to see how that community is welcomed in the territories. There's also some questions I think about um, uh, about Hamas and Palestinian soldiers. If if the tours cover uh, the tunnels dug by Hamas and the rocket launchers, and um, a question about the you know if the tour goes to the Church of the Nativity um, where some soldiers held uh, some of the clergy hostage. So first, uh, yeah, question if there are specifically LGBTQ tours with, with that theme. So there are queer anti-occupation Palestinian organizations and organizers who um, have absolutely welcomed tourists to, to learn more about queer Palestinian organizing. And there are absolutely, um, de definitely, uh, a lot of work around what's called pinkwashing, which is it, when Israel um, has, so an, a pinkwashing initiative on the part of Israel is an initiative to uh, broadcast, celebrate um, LGBTQ advancements in um, Israel as a way of dismissing Palestinian claims um for of freedom struggles dismissing palestinian uh discussions of uh, what occupation looks like dismissing palestinian all of the same sort of things that i talked about during my whole talk around terms of legibility and in terms of when palestinians are not rendered um legible narratives of their own displacement and so these kinds of of questions are ways to uh also discount those claims so um, so yes, there's absolutely queer Palestinian organizing. There's queer Palestinian organizing that takes up homophobia the way that there's queer organizing elsewhere that takes up questions of homophobia. Um, there's also queer Palestinian organizing and delegations to Palestine that deal with how those forms of pinkwashing work, right? And how they function and how they work as part of colonial state practice. Great, thank you. Um, Joshua asked a question. Well, he says, great talk, great for a talk on an interesting, oh, thanks for a talk, great talk on an interesting and important topic. Are most of the solidarity tourists coming from a particular place, the US, Europe? Are there any solidarity tourists from global 
South countries? How does this shape their engagement or experience? Thanks so much. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of, there are a lot, it depends on the tour, right? So there are a lot of tours that are um, repeating, that are, that have, so like the Olive campaign that are seasonal. And on those tours, tourists come and they often bring back members of their families and they often bring back their kids and they often bring back their um, communities. And those are often uh, tour, tour, tourists from the US and Europe but there are also thematic delegations and there are also South-South delegations and there are also uh, anti-prison um, delegations. And there are also many different kinds of delegations that are more um, thematic. And also you asked the question about Christian Zionism, which is has to do with different types of tourists as well. So some tourists are also like Christian youth pastors who are coming to Palestine to um, learn about, learn from Palestinians, and then also bring back that knowledge to their congregation. So they are trying to help their congregations reshape their relationship to Zionism and the relationship to Zionism with which they were raised. So the tour guides vary. So it's a lot of times, like in the book, I talk about how solidarity tourist is almost like an incoherent category because a solidarity tourist includes like white youth pastors like Marietta Macy, it includes Palestinians who can only return to Palestine as tourists, right, whose families were exiled in 48 or 67 or in between or after. So there, there are so many people that go into a solidarity tour that it's hard to name who a solidarity tourist is. Um, but it really depends on the, the different type of tour and it depends on how that tour is organized and where it's from, where it's organized from. But thank you for your question. Next, I have a question from Brooke. Um, you've talked about forms of shock and surprised. I'm wondering whether there are differences between the two and whether the tours that may be associated with are different. Attending a solidarity tour, a solidarity tour in Palestine, I felt shocked, but not surprised. Is there a difference? Is it significant? Oh, I love this question. I think, I mean, I think that there are, I think it operates different for differently for different tourists. So I think that the um, the sort of question of what it means to be shocked by something and what it means to be surprised by something and the extent to which they're different is is a really important question because it, it asks how one navigates um, even information they expected to uh, witness but are still viscerally affected by it. And I think that's a different, I think that sort of visceral um, response to witnessing is a different thing than shock and a different thing than surprise. Um, I had, and I think that when I talk about the sort of shock and surprise, um, I flag things like there, like there were uh, one interlocutor who was um, Sarah Alzanun, who I had talked about in, a, in an earlier section, um, she talked about how she knew it was going to be bad, but it was a hundred times worse than she was expecting. So that idea of like a hundred times worse uh, for us, a Palestinian, right. And thinking through like what it means to confront something being even worse than you expected. So I think that that comes in with the sort of not the lack of surprise, but, or the absence of surprise, but the presence of shock. But I think one of the things that I'm more trying to like articulate and I had I dealt with this with the the manuscript re reader reports because the reader reports um asked, like, asked a question like that like what does it mean what how do you think through the sort of affective response to being in Palestine for the first time and witnessing all the things that you read about right and I think that it I think it is it does become this formula and I think that it, one of the things that I'm trying to point to is for tourists to think about what that formula is what the subtext of that formula is so what the subtext of saying like i couldn't believe this until i saw it um it's it's shocking even though i'm standing here right like what the subtext is and what that has to do with the sort of volumes of literature that palestinians have produced so i think i think grappling with the differences between shock and surprise but also holding um also flagging that sort of tension and also thinking through 
what that means and what's underlying it is a is an important way to think through some of these formulas that report back that the report back genre really traffics in. Yeah, thank you. And there's um, a similar a question that corresponds from Leslie. So she says, congratulations on your amazing work. I'm really curious to know if there were any folks from your interviews who were not shocked or surprised at what they witnessed during their tours and where might those reactions stem from? I think that there are, there are definitely, um, tourists who go who are not shocked I think there's also a sort of performance of there's so much happening in the scene of the tour right like there's also sometimes a performance of not being shocked that is is a sort of um claim to intimacy with Palestine or histories of activism or all like people work out all sorts of things on solidarity tours so I think one one thing um in terms of how people communicate not being shocked is through like different practices of listening. So I think there are multiple different practices of listening that happen on, in the space of a solidarity tour. And I think that sometimes that listening takes the shape of being really reflective and quiet, right? And sometimes that listening, it, so much of it is pedagogical. Like so much of it is the same kind of things we think about in the classroom or think about in terms of teaching. And, and think about how people learn differently. So some people learn more as like quiet learners, some people learn more through engagement. And so I think that on the space of a solidarity tour, there are different types of personalities and there's different types of negotiating what people are seeing. Um, but yeah, I think there are definitely people who come who are not surprised, but who are, whose work is galvanized by being in Palestine. I think there are people who come who are not surprised, but shocked like Brooke said, right? Or not surprised but also dealing with like i think there are different levels of surprise too because what happens sometimes is tourists for example palestinians who are not able to enter israel except as a tourist in some of these contexts are not surprised by the material on the tour but are surprised by other tourist reactions to it so there's not only sort of like people na navigating what they're learning but also people navigating the the different positions differently positioned people on the space of the tour and we have a we have a question from pat um it's maybe it's less of a question but a but a statement in in, in solidarity i could say but I'll, I'll read it uh, thank you professor i was recently on a solidarity tour in the occupied territories in israel it was everything you described seeing the facts on the ground spending time with Palestinians and, and, and Israelis who oppose occupation, making friends with people there who I will never forget. One of our Palestinian Christian guides said, quote, make us visible. We are invisible. Nobody knows about us. We are barely recognized. Give us recognition. We are people. I need to feel I'm a human being. I wake up with his words every day, working to bring this information to Americans. Thank you so much for that. I think. Also, one of the things I talk about in the first chapter is on the um, first intifada delegations and the first intifada delegations, um, some of the, maybe he was crying, some of the report backs um, talk about the, that exact thing, right? Talk about like people saying to them, like, go tell us, go or go tell Americans, tell people what's happening here, what's really happening, right? And I think one thing that tourist tour guides have to grapple with is the repetition of that and the way that that makes the work feel um, futile, but how it actually doesn't make the work futile. So people, like I ha would have talked to, to shop owners who said things like, um, if more and more like people tourists come every day so if tourists come every day why why is this still happening right like why like and there's this sort of idea like oh if americans only knew right and i think sometimes that's really true and sometimes people don't know and i once interviewed an, an anti-zionist israeli tour guide um who i asked her like what does it feel like to do this work to audiences that should know better right and she said she said they, why should they know better like their media tells them nothing and so there's a generosity on the part of tour guides to deal with people coming and to keep saying, like, keep saying, please render us visible, please render us um, legible, right? 
But what I'm trying to talk about too is the way that like Palestinians in the historical record, in their scholarship, in their literature, in their histories, in everything that they write, in their archives have done this work too. So I think that there's something about being a tourist that where you go and see instead of um, reading that literature, right? That that uh, is a problem. But I also think there are a lot of tourists who are doing exactly what you described, who come and they didn't know and they see, and then they read voraciously after that and they learn voraciously after that. And their experience in Palestine really galvanizes their work and galvanizes like a lifetime of work and a lifetime of, of dealing with, with what they didn't know, what they didn't do and doing something differently. Thank you. And um, Elian says, thank you for your answer. One more question, if you have time. I'm curious about the main things that made you approach the new genre of solidarity. And then I'm also interested in how you became interested in this area of study and research for yourself. Thank you for that. I, um, I came to this project at Santa Cruz because I did, um, my, like I said, my undergrad in feminist studies and literature. Um, at UCSC and at the time in 2000 to 2005, almost every, I had two tracks. One um, was post-colonial studies and literature and one was uh, comparative colonial studies or women of color feminisms in uh, feminist studies. And both tracks um, dealt very significantly with um, post-colonial studies and with comparative colonial studies and both tracks assigned Said, Edward Said's work in, in I, like I read the intro to Orientalism across like multiple classes in both majors and not in one class that I ever have anyone talk about Said as Palestinian, not did that ever have any class talk about Palestine. And so there was this um, omission then, and then with the exception of one class, which, I, which was racial and gender formations, um, that Gina then taught, that I teach now, right? And so like one class across both these majors. Um, and I grappled with that omission. I went to grad school uh, to do my master's at NYU. And I took a lot of my classes with Ella Shohat. And I um, dealt, basically did in my master's work, courses in between Middle East studies and American studies, and even the courses in American studies that were trying to do uh, work on US empire, work on the relationship between Middle East studies and American studies, we're still not grappling with Palestine. So I was dealing with this omission at the same time that I was dealing with my um, mom's family who uh, are all Christian Zionists. And so I was trying to deal, trying to think through what is the relationship between this omission, even in comparative colonial studies, what is going on with Christian Zionism, right? What is the relationship between Christian Zionism and the Republican voting bloc? And so I wrote my master's thesis on that. Um, and a big part of Christian Zionism is tourism. And tour and that we saw this in the explosions in May of all the neighborhoods in Jerusalem to make way for a King David biblical park, theme park, right? So Christian Zionism has everything to do with tourism, which has everything to do with displacement in Palestine, not, not even to mention the sort of like voting politics of the US. So, Tourism became really interesting to me, um, also because I studied tourism at, even in undergrad um, across both majors. And I was always interested in the relationship between tourism and colonialism, which is reflected in the sort of Christian Zionist tourism. And so when I started the PhD at UT Austin in American Studies, I began to really think about what is, what are the responses to this kind of tourism and how do, how, is there a way to think about anti-colonial tourism? And I learned a lot from scholars in Hawaii who do this work, who do who think about how and when tourism can do anti-colonial work or be pressed into the service of anti-colonial work. And so I started to think about how and when Palis that happens in Palestine. And initially I conceived of the project as like a response. So like um, pinkwashing tours and then LGBTQ anti-Zionist tours uh, to think about Christian Zionist tours and then Christian anti-Zionist tours. But once I started the research, it became a much longer history about how solidarity tourism began in Palestine during the First Intifada and has shifted and changed with each moment, with each sort of organizing directive. Um, 
and it became a much longer history of of solidarity tourism and much more local history of solidarity tourism than than i thought it was going to be okay i have a uh, questions from from shante um it's it's kind of a long question so i'm going to paraphrase a little bit uh, with the high profile assassinations of individuals like rachel corey and most recently palestinian american journalist uh, shireen abu akhle um, uh, is the Israeli government hostile to uh, to solidarity tourists uh, and NGOs and activists, and are there inherent dangers in embarking on solidarity tours in Palestine? Thank you, Shante. Um, so I, so this is an this is an important point that I asked uh, organizers about, and one Jordan Flaherty, who I um, talk about in the introduction. Uh, described a shift after the international solidarity, a shift in the international solidarity movement organizing after Rachel Corey, right? And so a sort of shift in like, what, do, what does it mean to invite people to be protective presence when they're not protected? And so he described that shift as um, moving away from protective presence and Another scholar um, whose work was really formative for mine, Sophia Samatopoulou Robbins, writes in um, this essay about prosthetic engagement, and she calls ISM workers' um, relationship to Palestine as one of prosthetic engagement, where they feel similarly occupied in Palestine by, in terms of the duration of their stay, in terms of the longevity of their stay, in terms of their sort of embeddedness in Palestinian communities. And so there was a shift in organizing after this and the solidarity tourism um, encompasses that shift because solidarity tourism is asking people to come and be tourists. So, so much of it is tourism, right? It's a week long at the most usually. Um, it's not usually attached to volunteer stays or longer trips. It is about pleasure it's about palestinian food it's about palestinian hosts it's about learning about the occupation but it's also about seeing um like tanya habjuka writes about uh, occupied pleasures so i think that there is policing of of this kind of tourism because of all those things that it reveals and the work of tour guides is to is to show all of like all those expectations, all of the kinds of tours, um, or all the kinds of, of ways that people live differently, right, in Palestine. And I think that one of the expectations that they confront is that Palestine is dangerous, right? And I think one of the things that tour guides or tourists almost always say is that they felt no danger in Palestine, right? They felt like completely um, able to sort of like fumble and get lost and ask for help and figure out where they are and all those kinds of things as a tourist um but felt really scared with the sort of militarized violence they saw at checkpoints with the militarized violence they saw um even with the kind of like interrogation at ben Gurion and really really unused to seeing guns right except for um seeing them on or unused to seeing them when they would see them on the IDF or when they would see them on Israeli settlers or when they would see them in, in spaces, really militarized spaces. So I think those are the spaces that are, um, that tourists read as dangerous in Palestine. Great, thank you. There's one last question and then there's a comment. Um, so the, this question says, last question from Eliane, I promise. Um, do you have any specific critique for the role of the Palestinian Authority in supporting the solidarity tourists? I look forward to hearing from you about this because I want to see ourselves, the Palestinians, through your eyes and from different perspectives. Yeah, I think the, the critique of the Palestinian Authority in it comes from solidarity tour guides themselves. And I think that one of the things that I one of the things I write about is how solidarity tourism itself emerged from emerged as both a a product of the Oslo Accords and a critique of the Oslo Accords and a critique of the the role of the PA too in terms of what because what happens is is what kind of sites get prioritized in 
in tourism to Palestine. And what a lot of the tour guides and organizers who are trying to do decolonial tours and anti-colonial tours and tours that showcase not only the occupation, but also what it's like to um, live under occupation. One of the things that those, um, one of the things that the PA sort of highlights will, will be like apolitical tourist sites. And one of the things that the tour guides are trying to show is that there are no apolitical tourist sites, right? That all of these tour, all of these sites are in, um, deeply uh, like palimpsest, like layered on top, like lots and lots of different colonial histories layered on top of one another. So I think there are many critiques to be made of the PA um, and of the, of what it prioritizes. And I think that there are tour guides working in a in this colonized sector trying to flag not only Israeli state violence, but also the violence they experience from the, the PA. And I think one of another thing that um, Rivka Barnard writes about this, and I write about this in the end of the second chapter is moments like in the Church of Nativity Square where solidarity tours will try to flag not only the contemporary state violence, but also um, when there have been um, Israeli sieges in Bethlehem, right, which is supposed to be an area protected from that. And they will have, there was one moment when they had um, tear gas uh, uh, canisters formed into ornaments and were trying to make a statement during Christmas, during a high tourism event um, and were punished and, and violently policed by the PA to not have, to not be displaying that history. So there is also, of course, um, and this is one of the points about not having like a, not insisting that there's like a unified certain specific one singular Palestinian perspective because there are um, many different things that organizers of guides or organizers of solidarity tours are trying to critique and work against. Well, thank you, Jennifer. I, uh, we still have several good questions in the Q&A box, but unfortunately, we're about out of time. So, I, you know, I'd like to thank the audience for all of your amazing, insightful questions. Uh, we tried to get through as many of them as we could, um, and I wish we could answer all of your questions. But uh, perhaps you can, you know, you can find uh, uh, Jennifer's contact information uh, on her uh, alumni profile or on her, her UCSC profile page. Um, I do encourage you to contact her uh, outside if you're interested in her research. Um, so again, thank you, thank you very much, everybody, for attending. My name is Mike Reapy, along with April and David. I'm one of the volunteer organizers of the Slugs and Stein series. Please join me in applause for Jennifer Kelly. Thank you, Jennifer, for thank sharing. Thank you all so much. Yeah, thank <laughs> and uh, thank you, Jennifer, for sharing your research with us this evening. The talk has been recorded, and it will be available on the UC Santa Cruz Arts and Lectures YouTube channel in a few days. Our thanks also thank to the so staff. Much. Go ahead, Jen. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just thanking you all for, for the invitation and thank you everyone for your um, really engaging questions. Oh, thanks. I'm uh, sorry. I should have paused. Um, we really enjoyed having you here. Uh, I'd also like to give thanks to the staff of the Alumni Relations and the University Events Offices who organized this webinar. Uh, thank you, Shana, Diana, Paulina, and Kristen. Our next Slugs and Steins will be Monday evening, July 11th, and will feature Professor of Chemistry and Biochemistry, Carrie Parch. Professor Parch graduated from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill with a PhD in biochemistry and biophysics, where she worked with Aziz Sankar to study the molecular basis of circadian rhythmicity. She went to the quote dark side for her postdoctoral fellowship, training in biophysical techniques, including solution NMR spectroscopy at UT Southwestern Medical Center. In her lab at UCSC, she and her students strive to address the following questions. How do animals measure time and use it to control biology on a daily basis? You may also be interested in the next virtual crawl lecture this Wednesday, June 15th from 5.30 to 7 p.m. Professor of Astronomy Rebecca jensen Clem will lecture on habitable exoplanets with extremely large telescopes. For more information about uh, these talks and many others, go to events.ucsc.edu. On behalf of the UC Santa Cruz Alumni Association, thank you for joining us.
And please come back on July 11th at 6.30 p.m. for our next virtual event. Good night, everybody.